Hello, everyone. Good Folks in the back, you want to move closer? Yeah. It's, it's out of room. Come on up. Um, it's so great to be here. Janet, and I've known Janet and her husband, John, as she said, uh, since the uh, mid-'80s. Um, she's had me here at South by Southwest a few times. I've had a couple of films here, one um, called Finding the Funk, A History of Funk Music. Um, what was the other film? Jesus. Oh, I did a, a film on Magic Johnson called The Announcement. Um, I was actually a judge at the film festival one year, so um, it's been fantastic. And Janet kind of hits on the fact that we've had, I've had kind of this weird career, um, and she kind of wanted me to talk about transitions. Transitions both professionally, transitions personally, how do things interact? And I thought I'd start by talking about the, the, the jobs I've had. Um, she met me, I was a full-time music critic. Then I became a, a newspaper columnist. I've been a cultural historian, a Hollywood screenwriter, an award, t award show TV host, I mean producer, a travel show host, a documentary filmmaker, a TV movie director. I'm just coming from Vancouver where I just am um, editing a Lifetime movie of all things. Uh, a novelist, a college professor. I've done some acting actually, small cameos. Um, done voiceovers for radio commercials, and even dabbled a bit in theater. Uh, moreover, I've done a lot of these things at the same time. I really don't have like a single unifying concept about how I've been able to do or move, negotiate these different worlds other than uh, number one is that I, I'm a writer and uh, I love the art of storytelling and it's the core of every, every of these disparate careers, um, the, the ability to put sort of words together to take the world's chaos and make them into some kind of order has been paramount. But the other element which is going to take up most of my conversation here today is uh, I've always been sensitive to cultural movements, to shifts in taste and aesthetics, and I've been able to use that awareness to adapt to the new normal being created around me. So I'm going to go into sort of a long biographical, autobiographical riff here that hopefully will um, pull all these threads together. Some of this is going to be ancient history for many of the folks in here. Some of it's so ancient that uh, you might not, uh, you probably weren't born when most of this happened. But I believe that the threads of the past lead to the current future. At least that's what it's been for me. Um, the first song I remember hearing, uh, is that the screen up there? Ah. <laughs> the first song I remember hearing was a song called Charlie Brown. It's recorded by a group called The Coasters. And it played incessantly on my mother's clock radio and on the transistor radios that people carried around Brooklyn. Those things had long, long antennas, and they were the boom boxes of the era, where people carried them really close to their ear and bopped their way down the streets of our city. The um, thing that's interesting about Charlie Brown is that the song is, is uh, named after Peanuts' character, obviously. But the content of the, of, the, of the song is kind of about a rebellious teenager, what they used to call juvenile delinquents. Juvenile delinquents were the, the thugs, uh, the, the bad boys of the 50s. Uh, Marlon Brando, that kind, of, that kind of juvenile delinquent. And in that film, uh, a couple of things are noteworthy. One was that uh, Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley was played in the opening credits. Probably the first use of rock and roll music in a Hollywood movie. The other is that there was a, uh, I saw a small part from a young Negro actor named, is he good here? He's back there. Come on. How's it going? This working? Hey, Black Boy Jungle. Uh, was a guy named Sidney Poitier, who played uh, a, a Negro juvenile delinquent. Um, the first movie I remember seeing in a theater was Marnie in 1964. One of Hitchcock's psychosexual thrillers starred Sean Connery just off becoming James Bond, and Tippi Hedren, uh, the title character, a, a cool kind of blonde, the dysfunctional blonde, the kind of character that Hitchcock obsessed over. And there's a scene in the movie where uh, Connery and Hepburn are having an argument. They're sort of both wearing towels. She slaps Connery, and then the cut is to her feet and you see the towel at her feet. And he cuts to Connery's eyes. And there's this look in Sean Connery's eyes 
that I'd never seen in 1964 when I was like seven years old. I don't know what that's, but I remember that we, we had Chinese food after the movie. I was like, all I could think about was like, what was he seeing? Um, it will be the first time that I edit in a film lingered with me, but not the last. So I think my mother had taken me to see uh, Marnie because at the time Alfred Hitchcock actually had a TV show, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, which was a half hour anthology show, which was full of bizarre, whimsical, and occasionally murderous stories about life in America and other places. Um, I don't think my mother actually knew that uh, Marnie was gonna be as sexual as it was gonna be, um, but there you go. So by the time I was around eight years old, I was addicted to listening to Top 40 radio. I loved watching 45 RPM records spin on the turntable on my mother's Motorola Hi-Fi. I also knew Hitchcock's name was associated with kind of visual pleasure and that there were directors who had a power through their name and they had a brand kind of. They didn't know what brand was, but a style, I guess. And uh, I vaguely understood that when a, uh, a woman's towel fell to her feet, uh, there was something pretty powerful to be seen. So by the early 70s, I was spending late nights way past my bedtime. I slipped one of these transistor radios into my bed and listened to music all night long. Um, back then, you'd hit these AM frequencies at late at night would float through the airwaves and you could catch radio stations from Philadelphia, from Delaware, from other parts of the country. And so that was kind of my, my lullaby to myself. Later, um, my mother got me a combination turntable, radio, and uh, I'm gonna switch by that, an eight track cassette player in my bedroom. Anybody remember eight tracks? Okay. Um, I got addicted to an eight track of Sly's Family Affair from There's a Riot Going On album, the classic uh, dark, demented album by Sly. I remember uh, just falling in love with the sound of the drum machine. One of the first drum machines used in any popular song at the time was on Family Affair, uh, called the Rhythm Master, I think it was. And uh, there's also this electric piano groove that comes, comes in it and you kind of hear it really loudly through, through the fade. So I was learning that the elements of music were beginning to kind of come to me and Sly became my, um, my introduction to all of that. Um, also that song, A Family Affair, has this line, uh, blood, stick, stick up in the mud, it's a family affair. And uh, for me, I look back on that time as that was, that lyric was symbolic of a kind of change that was happening in movies in Hollywood. Now Sidney Poitier had grown from background Negro to the civil rights era's black superstar in the 60s. He spoke to King's English in a series of late 60s hits, always in a white shirt and tie, always poised, respectable, impeccable, a role model. But by the time that there's a riot going on was happening, Times Square grindhouses were full of different kinds of heroes. Uh, there were all these men and women who were reckless, like sly cinematic peers, but on the big screen. Uh, flamboyantly garbed men and women named Shaft and Superfly and the Mac and Foxy Brown and Hammer and Coffee and Trouble Man. Characters who strolled and rolled through the streets of Harlem and Hollywood and every ghetto in between to the dense funky soundtracks of masters named Isaac Hayes, Curtis Mayfield, Willie Hutch, Marvin Gaye, James Brown. The Black Exploitation soundtracks were part of a golden age of mu musical ambition that saw Miles Davis plug in his horn and electrified jazz. Stevie Wonder turned his synthesizer from a kind of experimental thing into a staple of pop music. And Philadelphia's Gamblin' Huff orchestrates soul music with a clear moral intent. These images and sounds of early 70s, a, a fertile brew of swagger and funk, flashy threads amid ghetto limitations, black power politics, and bell-bottom flair are the bold, bodacious soil that birthed both disco and later its cousin, hip hop. And this is where I enter the story as a participant. In the late 70s, I was attending St. John's University in New York City while living in East New York, Brooklyn. I also had wrangled internships at two very different publications, the Amsterdam News, which was the Black Weekly in New York, and Billboard Magazine, the music trade publication. Now in most current narratives about New York City, uh, this period in the 70s is considered the bad old days. 
But for me, age 18 to 22, the riding metropolis was a city of unrivaled opportunity, dangerous curves, and salacious delights. You could avoid getting mugged or shot, which wasn't always easy. Uh, it was a place that rewarded hustle and artistry. So I'd wake up in East New York in the far ass end of Brooklyn, take a bus and a train and another bus to school in Queens. After classes, I'd take a bus, a train, and then another train up to Harlem to the Amsterdam News. After some time there, writing and getting assignments, I'd blissfully take one train to Midtown Manhattan to Billboard. And if I got lucky, I could score an invite to a club, a concert ticket, a movie screening, uh, before eventually winding my way back to Brooklyn. This was my life for uh, most of my years in college in, in the late 70s. Now, though both gigs were internships for college credit, I also, uh, being a New York City hustler, had managed to get them both to pay me off the books as a freelance writer. So I was both uh, working and getting paid and getting college credit, which is how you do things in New York. Uh, now, though both, uh, at the time, the Amsterdam News, I was doing entertainment reporting. So I, I covered things like The Warriors opening. The Warriors was this sort of pseudo New York gang movie sort of done with, as comic book archetypes uh, that spawned, uh, people talk about rap hip hop riots later, but The Warriors had fights in, this, in theaters around the country and there was lots of coverage of it. It went number one and it was the first sort of inkling of this kind of urban culture that was bubbling under, uh, but refracted through Hollywood at the time. I also got to see some great movie premieres. I went to the premiere of Apocalypse Now uh, at the Ziegfeld Theater, and I'll never forget the sound of the helicopters and the opening of that coming through the speakers uh, of that huge, that now departed New York Theater. I was at the screen, first screen of Star Wars in New York City, um, and I got in slightly late. I found a seat way in the front, just as the words are scrolling up, and the crowd was already electric. But I also saw one of the worst movies ever made, which is Exorcist Two. <laughs> And if you ever get a chance, to, if you're like high or whatever, and you know, <laughs> Exorcist 2 is a real good thing if you're expecting terrible quality. But despite the free movies, and the, which meant free dates and free popcorn, I did feel a little cheated. The black exploitation era was long over. Hollywood had moved on from black film, with the exceptions of films directed by a guy named Michael Schultz, who did Cooley High, Car Wash, and, and uh, Which Way Is Up was Richard Pryor, and Richard Pryor himself, who became Hollywood's new go-to movie star. There was also a really horrible uh, adaptation of the Broadway show The Wiz. Uh, it was probably Sidney Lumet's worst film. Um, noteworthy only now because that's where Michael Jackson, as a scarecrow, met Quincy Jones and began the collaboration that would kind of change pop music. Uh, the only spark of black cinematic life that was going on was happening in libraries, museums, community centers, um, even at discos sometimes. And these were the early films of people like Julie Dash, Warrington and Reggie Hudlin, Charles Lane, and Spike Lee. And it was only seen really by some cinephiles, um, academics, and a few regular folks. So that whole wave of independent black film that kind of popped in the, really in the late 80s was happening, but very, very underground. Uh, I had a similar feeling of kind of, of being cheated a bit in my billboard gig. I was the office mascot. So I basically did all of the gigs that no one else wanted to do. So here I am, I'm, in, I'm a 19-year-old black kid at a Ted Nugent concert <laughs> at Madison Square Garden in 1978 with ACDC opening. Okay, uh, I saw Bad Company, Fog Hat, Hot Tuna. Those of you who know these bands know, wow, there was a little bit of culture shock for the brother. Um, as I was saying, I always say that the, there were ash can firecrackers being shot off, Jack Daniel bottles were in full effect, uh, and the kids all looked like characters from Days and Confused, because they basically were those kids from Days and Confused. At the same time, uh, I was getting more than my share of disco coverage because most of the guys they want to do cover disco. So I would go to see First Choice, I saw Sylvester, a uh, bunch of other uh, popular, the Salsa Orchestra, and mostly gay clubs, uh, where I learned to hold my water rather than <laughs> enter the Sodom and Gomorrah that was the men's room. <laughs> so I was paying my musical dues at the height of stadium rock and disco. All the while yearning for the glory days of funky soul I had raised on, and the badass images of black style I loved as an adolescent. A new world opened up to me in the late 70s. 
A mentor of mine at Billboard magazine, a guy named Robert Rocky Ford, was told by retailers at a space called Downstairs Records, which was a record store in a, um, the 42nd Street subway station, that he was getting uh, a lot of what he called mobile jocks, which were kind of, we'd call D DJs now, they call them jocks back then. From uptown, we're buying huge quantities of what were called cutout records. Now, cutout records, most records were at $9.99 or $8.99 or even high, maybe even $10.99. Cutouts were records that hadn't sold. So they were being sold in discount bins, $2.99, $1.99, even $0.99. Cents. Um, and this is what the kids from uptown were buying. So one Saturday afternoon, I found myself in the South Bronx, just off the Grand Concourse in a schoolyard, watching as a young man and his crew drove up in a van, opened up the base of the streetlight, took out some industrial wire, plugged it into the base of the streetlight, ran the wire through the fence, and ran the fence, the wire into some turntables and um, mixer. Uh, also, huge speakers. And this young man turned out to be a guy named DJ Cool Herc. Uh, what Cool Herc was playing out of, out of these records was very different from what I'd heard at the discos I, I frequented. When I asked him what he was playing, he said B beats or break beats. Since he was playing the rhythmic break parts and both mostly the introductions and the bridge of records. The crowd was very young many preteen, uh, people who wouldn't be able to get into a disco. One reason that, uh, that hip-hop started in the streets was literally the crowds going to the shows were so young that they wouldn't have been allowed in a club anyway. We're talking, at this point, 14, 15, 16-year-olds. I, I do not remember anybody rapping per se. I do remember people sort of, yo, who hurt, who hurts on the mic, 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 you know, that kind of stuff, but not really the rhyming that we think of now. Um, and it was not called hip-hop. Okay, very important. That term wouldn't come into general use until maybe 82 or so. So back in the 70s when this happened, it was, they would call it B-Beats. Almost every DJ had their own name for what they called it. The second big bang for me in terms of this culture happened in front of a Blimpies on 125th Street. I was standing eating my sandwich, and I hear a guy coming out. You can hear the sound coming on the block. Back in the day of the big boom boxes, right? And I heard someone talking on the mic over a beat, and I'd never heard anybody speak in rhyme like this. On radio, some black DJs had a rhyming style, but the way he was hitting the beat was just very different. And I yell out, yo, 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 what's that, what's that, what's that? And the guy goes, DJ Hollywood, don't you know? And he just kept on going. Um, and basically, this guy, DJ Hollywood, was a, I, you know, I'm from Brooklyn, so I'm just learning, I'm working in Harlem, but I'm from Brooklyn, so I'm just learning the uptown science. And um, Hollywood was this figure who was huge in Harlem. Uh, at after hours clubs as well as uh, parties. Uh, so there was a show around the same time at City College of New York in this big auditorium. It had Evelyn Champagne King, it had uh, Harry Melvin and Blue Notes, big acts. But DJ Hollywood was the musical interlude. So I got a ticket and went to see the show and realized that the 2,000 kids who showed up weren't interested in any of R&B artists at all. They were there to see Hollywood. Dip, dip, dab, so socialize. Open up your ears and wiggle your behind like a big, big egg. Go, what? And the crowd would go, popcorn. They all knew the routines. So anytime between the music acts came on and Evelyn did her thing, boom, he would play. And uh, I think it was one of the Starskys, he's a love bug or uh, June bug, Starsky was his MC. And he was cutting up things like, uh, ba -da -ba 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 -ba, song by Earth and Fire, Brazilian Rhyme. And just cut it up, cut it up, cut, boom, back, bring it back to the top. Because that track is only maybe uh, two minutes. So I was seeing hip hop again, or what we call hip hop, in a different way. And I was seeing an MC who was doing call and response in the way that we kind of associate with. So I was getting the sense that this was something that was happening that was new and was different. And as a result of these encounters, here's the Holy Trinity behind me Flash, Bambada, and Herc. And I actually did that article for the source back in the day. Um, as a result of all these two encounters with hip hop, I became one of the first people to write about it, doing stories from both the Amsterdam News and Billboard back, this is Herc, it's the Amsterdam News, which still exists up in Harlem. And this article I wrote, uh, DJ Herc and his B Beats, which is one of the first articles written, ever written about what we now call hip hop. I actually, quite honestly, don't remember it was 77 or 78. I believe it was 78. Um, uh, and looking back on it now, uh, it's funny because Clive Campbell, 
the records he's talking about, Disco uh, Scorpio, th these are like things were B-sides of singles. Uh, the Willie Dynamite soundtrack. So you see the interaction between the world of what was the black exploitation world and the beginnings of what hip hop was. Um, this is another piece I wrote right after. So this is in uh, probably late, 70, late 79 when the Sugar Hill Gang record is popping up. There's a few other records popping up. Uh, what happened actually, the Sugar Hill record first came out in I think September of 79. And then by December, people started jumping on it and making their own records. So there was like a sudden flood of rap records, including one by, uh, produced by a friend of mine, um, uh, by Curtis Blow, Christmas Rapping. So uh, people had been hearing about hip hop. It had been sort of happening, this rap thing. But it wasn't until the Chicken Hill Gang record broke through that the floodgates opened up and people were willing to give people record deals to make these records. Now, uh, da, 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 da. so from 1978 until maybe 1989, I'd say, I watched closely as a cultural movement grew that laid claim to the old music I treasured, embraced, but updated it with a street fly attitude of, of, of my adolescence. It gave voice to my generation of black kids. It opened doors of opportunity over and over again. As a reporter, I saw the many layers of opposition hip hop culture faced. White racists hated it. Black adult gatekeepers detested it. Established musicians labeled it a fad and its depiction of women, of violence, and street life, sometimes rightly, and I think often wrongly, offended people across every strata of American life. I won't go into every little known battle uh, hip hop fought in the 80s. There were many, and the culture always seemed to win, whether it was black radio, with MTV, or even getting booked into arenas as arena bookers. I had missed the civil rights movement, black nationalism, and the glories of 70s black music culture, early 70s black music culture. But I was a witness to a new thing growing even as the staples of black culture began to atrophy. Uh, this is Michael. In 1988, I published a book called The Death of Rhythm and Blues, which looked at the history of that great musical culture, relating to trends in radio broadcasting, retailing, record companies, record industry, and the civil rights movement. It wasn't hip hop that made me see R&B as a weakening culture. R&B's lack of urgency, its musical formulas, its flagging connection to the young audience, its very reason for existing uh, was ebbing away before my eyes and leaving a vacuum in the heart of America that something more rooted in struggle would fill. I was young enough to see that hating a new movement without paying attention to why it was rising is the path for extinction, extinction for any creator. A transition in black culture was happening and I knew I couldn't deny it, even if it meant a lot of what I loved was being pushed aside. Music mogul and current yoga guru, Russell Simmons, who I first met when he was promoting parties at roller discos in Queens, said something to me back in this period that I've never forgotten, and I think remains relevant to understanding any movement, political as well as cultural. He said, if your band is hated by the right people, it makes your core audience love it more. To Russell, who at that point was managing Run DMC, Public Enemy, the Beastie Boys, and other musical disruptors, the right enemies were good business. They built brand loyalty and confirmed that your fans were on the right side of history. Another lesson I took from hip hop's rise and R&B's decline, the idea that all the answers to moving forward came from people outside buildings. In the 80s, most of the major record companies and the most, uh, as well as magazine and book publishing companies were in skyscrapers on Sixth Avenue in Midtown Manhattan whether they were music magazine editors or a and executives. They had nice expense accounts, offices with views of the Manhattan skyline, and were totally clueless about the urban culture growing up all around them. The arrogance of all of those gatekeepers, black as well as white, pissed me off and became for me, as much as for any angry young rapper, a force that drove my writing. I would sit in my apartment on many nights first in front of my electric typewriter and later in front of my first computers, writing with a serious attitude. These people didn't know more than me. They were, getting paid they were getting paid to pay attention and they weren't paying attention. I vowed never to be that complacent. I was raised on Motown and James Brown. While they were high points in, in culture, they were not end points. 
I had to be just as engaged in the waves that were coming after them, whether it was Michael Jackson or Prince or house music or any of the different waves that were building on what, that foundation of great music I loved. You can't make transitions if you put your flag in the sand and never look to the next beachhead. That was a huge lesson I got from hip hop. Another thing I learned during that period at Billboard was POV. Uh, I would get records from amazing singers, singers who had amazing voices. But sometimes these records were just records with good songs. The people who tended to stick out, who had durability, whose stickiness in the culture had personas, had points of view. They were characters, whether they were Madonna or Prince or Bruce Springsteen, uh, three of the artists who came, who broke through, who still have relevance in the culture today. They were not perhaps the most talented people in the, of that era. You know, you can make an argument that Prince is pretty talented. But, you know, Madonna and Springsteen have limitations in terms of what they do musically. Uh, Bruce is a very set thing he does musically. Madonna vocally is very limited. But they had a point of view in their writing. They had a point of view in their clothes. Uh, and I think that's why they have endured. I remember seeing Madonna at a, meeting her for the first time at a club called the Red Parrot, which was a club on 57th Street, which is now a condominium. Um, and uh, thinking, my God, this girl's kind of trashy. Uh, she, she looked just like the girl in Definitely Seeking Susan. They, she, they did no wardrobe for that. That was her. Um, but she had a thing that was very, very distinctive. Point of view on religion, a point of view on sexuality. Uh, and so that, that's one thing that also came out of this idea of who are you, how do you fit into the stream of culture, how do you make transitions? Well, point of view is, is essential. Now, another peer I met uh, in that period who helped me kind of understand the lessons and opportunities of the era was a guy named Sheldon Spike Lee, who I moved around the corner from in 1985. Fort Greene is now um, one of the most desirable and uh, always been beautiful uh, neighborhoods in the country, certainly in New York. Brownstones are worth millions now. The areas now ring by expensive condominiums. But back in the 80s, it was considered a real estate no man's land. It was redlined by banks. It was ridiculed in newspapers as a dangerous Brooklyn hood. Yet for myself and a generation of uh, young creative talents, it was a promised land of cheap rents, large emptier spaces, and house parties every weekend. I met Spike through a mutual friend and viewed his Academy Award winning student film, Joe's Best Style Barbershop, He's Got Heads, on public TV. But I didn't know what Spike really had in store until I, I ran, moved, again, moved around the corner from him. He invited me to his house. Now I lived on, there's a street called Murder, Myrtle Avenue, it was still there, but it was then called Murder Myrtle. Uh, it was a pretty tough place. And I lived on this side and Spike lived on that side of Myrtle. So going to his house was an adventure. Uh, he lived in the back of a, he didn't even, the apartment was like in a garage in the back of a house. And literally all that was in the house was a bed, a poster of Michael Jordan, laser disc, remember laser disc, laser disc, laser disc player, and a giant editing machine. Now those of you who were born re more recently are lucky enough that you can edit your entire film in your lap, basically. Back then, Spike had a machine this big and reels and reels of film, um, and he showed me she's gotta have it. And I just thought that that film was, um, I'd never seen anything like it. It was a fresh voice, again, a point of view on life that I'd never seen before. I, it felt like the people that I knew it wasn't a Hollywood treatment of black life. And I actually had money for the first time in my life. I'd written a book on Michael Jackson, a quickie bio, and I actually had money. And I invested in She's Gotta Have It. Um, and the thing that really struck me about it is that Spike said to me, I want to write a book about the making of the film. And I'm saying, dude, you don't even have distribution for your film. No one even knows it exists. You're trying to get a book deal? But Spike had this way, and he still does, you know, this way of thinking ahead. Uh, and a way that seemed weird, and like, who would, a book about a movie about black people in Brooklyn, who were a woman dating, this is a movie, this is a book. Cut to, uh, he got the film distributed, we ended up doing a book. He ended up uh, opening up a clothing store called Spike's Joint in, in Brooklyn, and was way ahead of the curve in the sense of the marketing and the presentation of 
that it wasn't just about the movie. The movie was part of a tapestry of events that went along with it. Um, and so for me, it was, again, one of those things like, okay, the idea of what you make, he was, I mean, everyone takes it for granted now, but Spike was really ahead of the game in terms of your cultural product is one part of a package. This is, uh, and that if you want to cut through the noise, you can't just be one dimensional. Um, and just because something doesn't exist now doesn't mean it can't exist. And that's one, Spike was really great about that idea. So uh, as I watch Spike and I watch hip hop develop, I'm gonna ask myself uh, a bunch of questions. Like, did I wanna be reviewing records for 20 years? Would that be my life? Or was journalism really a uh, foundation I could build a more varied career and life upon? So in 1989, I left Billboard and began writing books and pursuing film and TV projects. I learned a lot in, at part of my life about transitions. One is that yes, you can transfer skill sets from one medium to another. And two, no, doing that wouldn't uh, be easy and there'd be lots of stumbling and bumbling in the dark and learning a new craft. And your cash flow would definitely suffer. And three, learning to walk with new legs is damn scary but you fall in order to learn getting up. Luckily for me, the marriage of hip hop and cinema that the black Mars Blackman character and she's gonna have it for a toll would carry me forward into the 90s. I would end up co-writing a film that starred the young Halle Berry called Strictly Business that was inspired actually by a house party uh, held by a hip hop record company called Uptown Records. Uh, I would befriend a young comedian named Chris Rock and work on a crazy movie called She's uh, CB4 uh, as a writer and producer, which is one of the first kind of true hip hop comedies. Uh, through Chris, I would end up working on an HBO series he did, The Chris Rock Show. I established a relationship with HBO and I ended up directing a movie uh, about HIV in, in, black, in black America called Life Support, the story of Queen Latifah. Uh, and the film only got green lit because Queen Latifah rapper turned actor wanted to do it. Uh, so it's interesting that, that so many of these twists and turns and interconnections from the early days of my career weaved into what I'm doing now. Um, now, um, 21st century, I'm happily middle-aged, looking forward to uh, the elder years coming up straight ahead. And I'm tr yet I'm making another transition. Um, for the first time in my life, I'm actually working on a scripted TV series. Uh, which goes back, um, it's about all of the things that I talked about earlier. It's about disco, it's about hip hop, the birth of hip hop, it's about New York in the 70s, and it's called The Get Down. And there's even a character in the series who's playing the young version of me, wandering around uh, the Bronx looking and meeting rappers. So it's a very strange experience how things can come full circle. It premieres August 20th. It'll be only the first six episodes. We still have uh, another seven. I wrote one uh, ep and I worked on all of them in various capacities. Um, so it's, I say it's a very interesting experience to, to go back to a younger version of yourself and trying to, uh, to be historically correct while also not being locked in to what happened in the sense that you can mesh, mash things up. And, um, you know, Baz is a, a, a hell of a director. He's got a vision of how, you hear the, how the music mix is composed. There's a Motown song in there by the Supremes called Up the Ladder to the Roof that's mixed in with um, an original rhyme. That's the film, the show, every episode will basically have at least two musical production numbers. We're probably the only TV show currently shooting and one of the only shoot ever that's a scripted show that has a full-time choreographer because we have massive production numbers. The brother you see in the white suit, uh, uh, Yaya, is gonna be a big star. He's one of the, he's actually a villain in this series. Um, and he basically was taught how to dance by, you know, to do that dance. Basically our black Travolta moment. Um, <laughs> so there's a, so uh, one thing that's really great about the show is that it's a mix of hip hop is here, it's underground. Because the show, the series takes place right now, these episodes, from 77 to 79. So it really is the prehistory of all of that stuff. As well as, was disco is here, 
and our lead actress uh, wants to be basically Donna Summer. So it's about how these two cultures kind of intersect in New York City at a particular point in time. But there's also uh, scenes at drag queen balls, there's scenes at punk rock clubs. Um, it's a pretty, pretty uh, wide range of New York, and you know, obviously the devastation and the opportunity of the city are both uh, depicted. So uh, it's been actually, you know, again, crazy to, to see stuff that was, stuff you did when you were 19, 20 years old, become now part of cultural history and, you know, a big Netflix show. Uh, so it's wild. So we have another 40 minutes, no, 20 minutes, excuse me. Uh, because microphone, anybody want to make a comment, ask a question? Um, I'm happy to entertain all comers. I'll get us started. No, so my name's Yafit Smith, and uh, I really wanted to thank you for A Ballerina's Tale. Oh, thank you. It was fantastic. I have a 14-year-old daughter who's in the dance and gymnastics world, and that, uh, that meant a lot um, you know, to us. And uh, I guess maybe I was interested in hearing a little more about your transitions and kind of uh, what some of those experiences were like for you. Maybe the most recent one, I guess, is to this series? Or? Sure. OK, maybe talk about that a little more. Yeah, so those of you who may not know, I, I uh, uh, directed a documentary about Misty Copeland, the uh, baller, black ballerina uh, at the American Ballet Theater, uh, released by IFC in theaters. There was a version of it, a short version of it on PBS earlier this year. And now it's on Vimeo, and it's on Netflix, and all over the place. Um, very, very great experience for me. Thank you for, for those words. Um, the funny thing about, about this show is that the first time I was approached, I turned it down. Um, I got a phone call about, from someone about working on it. I was like, Baz Lerman, hip hop? Eh, I don't know. And um, I was busy with other stuff too, and it seemed kind of fanciful. Uh, and then um, I got approached again, when I, and I had a meeting with a guy named Sean Ryan, who's a big TV showrunner, best known for The Shield. And he said, listen, we're doing this thing, please come in, we need you to come right away, you know. So I moved to LA two years ago for like four months and worked in a writer's room for the first time. And those of you who know TV may know about writer's rooms, but essentially they're these, these kind of creative melting pots where uh, most of the time they stick you in a room with a bunch of other writers, it's a steel cage match of writing. And uh, you guys try to figure out what the show's about with guidance from the showrunner and from the creator of the show, which was Baz. So we worked on the show. Uh, I lived out there for about four months. I came back. And then we worked some more, uh, time is all flaming together, at the beginning of last year. So I guess I must have went out there in 2014. And then last year we wrote some, a lot more in the spring, and then we started shooting, and we're still shooting. Um, when I come back to New York, I've been working on another project, but I'll go back to New York in a couple of weeks. I'll probably jump back into this and uh, work on it. So it's been a wild process. I mean. Uh, no one currently making films, I don't think, mix, mixes music and dance like Baz. And it's been a real transition, I think, for even the writers to how do we write a script like this? Uh, because for him, um, music is story. As you can see, like the way he, the, the, the weave of music, the different, the rhyming lyrics and the song lyrics, we're trying to do that twice a show, plus sometimes an intro. So, it's, a, it's been a huge learning curve. You turn in a 50-page script, you know, a four, but you realize that the music sequences are four or five minutes, and they take X amount of days to shoot. So I think everyone had to go, whoa, how do we do this? And Baz is not directing every episode. He directed the pilot, but he's supervising everything. Um, so it's been, it's, been a, it's been a really ambitious undertaking. I think more ambitious than even we all thought when we started because of the, of the level of mix of music. I mean, there's a couple of, I mean, Grandmaster Flash is involved. There's a guy playing Flash, you might have seen a Flash of. There's a cool Herc is involved, character playing him. There's a Bambata character. So we're diving in with, um, there's Ed Koch is in the show. So it's a mix of uh, real, our kids, basically a crew of about uh, five kids from the South Bronx who discover, they're not, they, didn't, they didn't create hip hop, they're part of the generation that Oh, it's happening. How do I get involved with it? Um, as I said, disco's happening. And also, crime is happening, because it was the beginning. Heroin was huge in New York at the time. Beginnings of angel dust. This is all pre-crack. You know, this is still 
Dust is the, is the big sort of underground drug. So the drug culture of the city, we also worked really hard to work in what we call the towers, literally the Twin Towers, where the city fathers were negotiating the future of New York City. So we've been trying to work in both the high, the low. It's a, it's a big undertaking, so we'll see how you folks like it. I know the movements that work are gonna be amazing, and we'll see how everything else works. Um, yes, I have uh, two daughters, and one is in Las Vegas, I mean Los Angeles now. Um, she has a degree, has no money. Is, is, is this still possible for someone who wants to get into filming and writing to meet people and to, to, to have the connections that you were able to, to make in the 70s, especially now with all this, you know, internet and it's all kind of... Uh, I think it's easier. Is it easier? I mean, what, what advice? I'm going to call my daughter after this. Okay. I mean, what advice can I give my 24-year-old who is trying to get into... What does she want to do? Well, she wants to write. She wants to, I mean... Well, number one, the writing is... is the, of the great thing about writing is that no one tells you you don't need an audience to write. Mm -hmm. So she should be writing a lot. And then two, depending on what she wants to write, she needs to use social media to get it out there. She either, if she wants to write screenplays, she should, just, believe me, there's lots of out of work actors in LA mm -hmm. that she can co connect with and uh, create short films. She can do spoken word readings of her things. She can do, I mean, I find actually that, as a point I made uh, in the speech about, the, about inside the buildings. The people inside the buildings in, in, in the modern media world um, are not the only gatekeepers. There's people who are making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year off of, of YouTube. So I just think it's a matter of her figuring out, I think the challenge becomes, it used to be I had to get a job, I have to send my resume, I have to send samples of my work into this person and wait for them to respond. That was really the gig, you know, or try and meet them at a club, right? But I think now it's about putting the work out there and building community. And I really think that that's possible. And I find that people who are in their 20s who are doing the best are the most entrepreneurial. So it's never been about waiting Totally, and now it's even less so. You can still, I'm, I'm, saying, I'm not saying you don't have to go meet people and don't have to do the, the gatekeeper dance, but that's not the only way to make, get yourself out there. So I think she just has to be creative and look at, uh, I think it's always useful to find role models. There must be some other writers doing stuff similar to what she wants to do in the same genre. She needs to see what the successful ones are doing and model themselves after that. So I, I think there's a lot of possibility. I think, I think it's probably tougher if I, if I was starting out again, I probably wouldn't be a music critic because I don't know that there's any way to make any, any kind of living. Maybe there is that I don't know about it, being a music critic. That then because you could write for The Voice, I would get 200 bucks from them. I'd write for the same article, interview with another. I just cobble together like, you know, 500 bucks a month. I could pay my half of the rent and, you know, get takeout food and boil eggs. And, and you know, I think it's a lot tougher to do that in New York now, but LA is, LA is actually pretty, having a really great renaissance. There's a lot of great music coming out of LA, a lot of great creativity, not in Hollywood, but in Silver Lake and in, in uh, East LA and, and other places. So I, I think there's a lot of possibility, just nothing's, take, nothing's given. She may not make it or make it what she, uh, one more thing I would say before we go on, is that what is her, I think one thing I had to learn too was what is your, your level of control, or I mean victory. When do you declare victory? You know what I mean? What, what are you trying to achieve? If you're trying to be Spielberg, well that's a, okay, it's a long slog. If you want to be able to make a living off your writing, that's another level of victory. You know, so I think, I think you always have to give yourself obtainable goals. Things that you can achieve that give you the momentum to keep going forward, because it's very easy to be discouraged. Hey, Nelson, David Lowenstein with PBS. It's great to see you again. You, you really are a national treasure, man. I want to thank you for your work over these last 30 plus years. Well, thank you, man. And um, I wanted to pick up on just like the lack of diversity, the whole Oscars so white controversy at this year's Academy and you know, from past years as well, and just see if you could comment. Um, I know in the past you did stuff with Bill Stephanie and Chris Rock, like this, the, the Comedy Central summer school thing and right. with the ill top at Howard University trying to nurture a pipeline for, for black comedic writers. But you know, 
like it's a dying breed. It's, it's few and far between. I mean, there are some young people like Chris Robinson and others <clears throat> in film, but like you, Stan Lathan, others that like are just masters of these crafts. Like, what what formal structures are are, are being put in place, or are there any to kind of nurture that pipeline? Well, I got to tell you, I, I everyone's focused on Oscars, but I would say TV so black. TV is a there's I was I've been I've been in Vancouver I shot a TV movie up there so I've been up living in Vancouver since January, the hotel I stay in. Between the CW. The 18 million other TV shows and movies shoot up there, black actors and black directors are working. I ran into Michael Schultz in the gym. Michael Schultz is a guy I referenced from way back in the seven. He shoots tons of TV. He's 70 something. Um, Eric LaSalle. I, mean, I can go to list it with, I mean, I, so TV is hiring black directors, hiring women directors. Uh, I think the writing thing is still to be cracked, but there's a lot of work for black actors on TV. And in fact, it's been very clear that in the last two years, three years, diverse programming is winning in the ratings. It's winning. So I think that what's interesting is there's so much focus on Hollywood, which basically, quite honestly, Hollywood is a shrinking business. They make fewer and fewer films. The few films they make are less and less interested in American values. They're more about how can I sell you know, comic book characters around the globe. I think we should be really focusing on TV. I think that's where the opportunities are. Uh, I think that's where the jobs are. And we're seeing the work. So there is a lot of, I, I also think the internet is become, I mean, like if you look at um, Lisa Ray, so forth. There's a lot of people breaking. I still think that that's the way to go. I think waiting around for the gatekeepers to find you, it can happen, and it still does happen. But that's not the only way. And I think if you have some, if you have a point of view that's strong enough, I think you cut through. And I think that's the gamble. I think the one thing about all of this stuff is you're gambling on yourself. Anytime you get into depicting the media entertainment business, it's all about taste. It's all about do I like this? Do I like that? Race plays a role in it. Obviously, class plays a huge role in it. Um, but ultimately, it's a gamble. There's no guarantee. I always say that to people because they always say, well, there's many times where I, I, you know, I almost failed. But failing sometimes is the best thing if you can learn from the failure. So. Thanks. Uh, appreciate you being here, obviously. It's really a great talk. And I'm kind of mad at my friend because she's supposed to write down your response, but she's asking a question, too. Um, <laughs> so my question to you is, I I'm in advertising, uh, creative, and been in that field for many years, but interested in making a transition fully into writing for film or television. Um, also a kid of hip hop and brought that to the branding and advertising world. So what would you say or advice could you give to someone who is passionate about a particular uh, area Area or movement, but hasn't personally lived it, but wants to write about it. Do you feel as though you would have been as suc successful in your projects had you not been uh, so immersed in the musical, hip hop culture, and seeing it give birth on the streets? So can you write about something if you haven't lived it? Well, people write about stuff all the time they haven't lived. So it can be done, it can be done well. Um, I would only say that perhaps what you might want to think about is what do you know and what are you deeply immersed in and passionate about and write about that. Because uh, there is a disconnect between those who research the culture and those who live the culture. It doesn't mean that the people who research the culture are wrong. It just there's a difference uh, of empathy. Um, because everyone brings their own individual journey no matter what they say. There's no objective writing. There's personal writing backed by research. That's the way I view it. So I would say two things. Whatever you're passionate about, research it, talk to the people involved in it, but also look into yourself and see what things are truly yours. Uh, and I, I find it, I, I found as a fact as I've gotten older, that going back to the things that I'm passionate about are what really pushed me forward. I'm not very good at just writing about stuff that I don't care about. And you just have to be very clear about that with yourself. Some people are fantastic at writing stuff but don't care about. One thing I learned in a writer's room is that there are, are writers who, who live in Hollywood who, who, are, who know the craft of storytelling for TV medium, how to set it up, second act structure. There's a whole uh, science that I was taught 
uh, 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 A story, B story, C. People know this thing. It's the whole thing. A story, B story, C. They have like a graph. This guy has a graph. You, you put all your A story beats, your B story beats, your C story beats, D story beats, and then you break them in like, like, a, like a mathematical equation. So there's guys who are fantastic at that, but a lot of them don't have any connection outside of, you know, L.A. meetings anymore to the, to the grit and grime of the world. And that's where you have the disconnects in so much storytelling. So go to your heart, I think. Hi, I'm Lauren, and I'm sorry, Vita. I didn't know I was supposed to be transcribing. I know, you're going to be okay. Um, so thank you very much for sharing. This has been just a phenomenal experience. And you said something really interesting um, about hating a new movement without understanding the cause of it is the rise to the path to destruction. And so with that as a backdrop, what are your thoughts on the current Black Lives Matter movement merging with Trump's rise? Well, I think that I, I think go too political, but just curious. No, I, I would just say because I think you thought, I think right now we're we're very clear seeing that that the middle path of American politics uh, and American media, which is part of the political discussion, uh, is not servicing a great many people, and whether that's the right wing people of Trump and Cruz, let's not let's keep him you know, senator in it, or the, or the Bernie Sanders wing or the Black Lives wing, that people are feeling like they're not, voices aren't being heard, and um, the middle is not servicing them. They don't feel heard, they don't feel respected. And so there's a really strong extreme view of what's wrong with America, critique from the right and the left, that I think that we may be seeing the breakdown of the, of the two-party system, which may have needed to have been broken down a long time ago, quite honestly, because obviously people are feeling like the, the middle ground of Democrats, not everybody, but enough people to, to cause a significant stink, are saying, we're not being serviced, we don't feel our voices being heard, uh, and we're gonna articulate it. Now, the, what's scary is that there are people uh, on both sides who are, who are very, very angry and not necessarily hearing other people. One of the weird, to me, one of the weird effects of the internet has been that people are able to tunnel vision their information so they don't hear any outside voices. They can just go Fox, or they can just go moveon.org, and they can stay in that lane, and all information comes through these conduits uh, with no gatekeepers and often no vetting. There's no independent vetting. The only good thing that came out of the years of the mainstream media was that there, that to some degree, they were responsible to facts. I'm not saying all the time, but there was some expectation. Like when I, when I wrote for The Voice, The Village Voice, you know, I, write for the, I wrote for The Times a few, few times in the past couple of years. There's an editor you meet with, there's a copy editor, there's a fact checker. So whatever goes in The Times, is, it goes to at least three or four different eyeballs before it gets in the paper. So it may not be everything you want, but it's pretty factual. Whereas anything on a blog, Joe Blow in his basement just put it up. And then it's, it's so I think that, that that kind of sense of information coming from these places with no outside voices critiquing it, I, I think that that's been bad. So I think all of these things are, t are tied together. I think the, the media, I think in a way that's where the internet has been destructive and that I know it's an interactive conference, but uh, there is a sense that information is just wild and there's no way to tell who's sending you what, how valid it is. And like some of the stuff that you hear from the left, from the right is crazy, but they seem to believe their information source. There's a woman here in Texas who's uh, saying that Obama was a prostitute and she's been told from a reliable source. Yeah, so, I, so I, I'm just saying that, that that's where we are. In the, so I don't know what this means in the long run. I do think it's, it's, uh, it's dangerous. But you know what, the world is a dangerous place. And I think we've lived in a very comfortable zone for a long time. And now we're dealing with some of the kind of anger that's, that's around the world. That's my short version. <laughs> Go ahead, man. Hi, um, thanks for sharing your story. So some context before I ask my question. So um, I'm Ash Arden, I'm from um, Detroit. I'm from Flint, but I live in Detroit. I've lived in Brooklyn on Willoughby. So I appreciate what you said about sort of urban experience and, and, and music. Um, my question, though, as somebody who, so I'm a fiber artist, but I'm also doing things in film and sonically, 
I'm curious about your personal creative practice and process. So I'm trying to use all the tools that I have to kind of tell a story in the best way I know how and not necessarily always um, doing what you're supposed to do. So the, the storyboarding in a specific way for a specific type of thing. I'm curious as somebody that does a lot of different things, how are you housing your ideas? Um, how do they come? What tools are you using? Um, and are you using technology at all to sort of um, you know, keep some of the information or ideas that you have? Uh, I, I, keep, I have a black and white composition book, <laughs> the same one that I've used since I was like, eight years old and I have if you went into my home there's like 300 400 maybe more than that scattered in file cabinets and I write everything from personal memoirs to uh, screenplays in these composition books and I have I've tried different things so that's the most technological I probably am mm -hmm. um, I do think that the idea of cards that they the, the sort of the card system that they use in different storytelling in Hollywood is very useful um, I think the thing is that all stories, the thing that is the toughest thing for me is figuring out what medium a story should be told in, mm -hmm. right? Um, movie stories tend to have a beginning, middle, and end. And, that, and, and, and with that in mind, I always think you've got to start at the end. What's your end? If you don't know, I've worked on screenplays, got totally lost, almost, okay. I was, it was, it was, it was, do you ask two questions? Okay, so I'll just keep it quick. Uh, for any kind of fi finitive, definitive narrative story, which is, a, which is mostly books mm -hmm. and movies and, and the mediums I work in, having an ending is crucial. Mm -hmm. Have to have an ending. Because I can't write, I can't write back, because I've often found I've written lots of books. Halfway through the book, I figure out what the hell a book is. Mm -hmm. I go to the end, I have to rewrite the whole beginning. Because yeah. I didn't really know where I was going. Mm -hmm. And that's for fiction and nonfiction. Uh, and the same thing happens in screenplays. If you don't really have an idea of where the characters are going to end up, you're going to get lost. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. I just, TV and film is different. TV is different because it's inherently, you're telling, you're writing your stories across a long journey, but you're also writing like this for the episode. So it's a different kind of structure than writing, let's say, a movie structure. Uh, you were here first, ma'am. Thank you. Hi, I'm Audrey Mailer. Um, thank you for your... Uh, conversation with us. I think you and I are probably the same generation, so a lot of your references were very familiar. <laughs> I'm an unscripted uh, TV producer out of Vancouver, so I do all that sort of sto A, B, and C stories right, right. in the grid. I know what you're talking about there. We have access to the uh, Death Row Records archive, and we're working on a documentary uh -oh. series. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, exactly. <laughs> so you talk about having moved into television from your um, career in music and kind of I don't know if it ended at the kind of rise of hip hop, but I'd love for you to comment on where hip hop and rap are going, where you think, you know, for me, it seems like they're becoming more enmeshed with the mainstream. Um, and um, yeah, what, what the relationship is with violence and, you know, we can't access a lot of the main players in that um, era because so many are either dead or in prison, so. Well, hip hop. Well. <laughs> It's always very, very dangerous for middle-aged men <laughs> to comment on contemporary hip-hop. So um, I would just say I love Kendrick Lamar. <laughs> and um, I like J. Cole a little bit. And, and I like a lot of what's going on musically. I actually like trap music. I don't like trap lyrics, but I like trap music. I think the tracks are crazy. I love the drama in them. I like the production. I think they're fantastic. I don't necessarily think that what's being rhymed over them is very interesting for an adult male. I'm like, dude, come on. Uh, but, you know, I'm not 16 or 17 in a club, you know, getting lit. So <laughs> that, that, that my relationship to the music is different than when I was younger. Um, I, like, I think that, uh, you know, hip hop was a voice of the voiceless and to some degree it still is. Uh, because, but I think the middle of what it is, there's so much of it has become just dance music. And you know what? It always was dance music. Most of the history of hip hop is it's dance music, despite what you know, people think about Public Enemy and certain you know, great moments of artists, Tupac, but it's dance music. If you ain't dancing to hip hop, then you probably really, really don't care about it. So it has to be dance music. And so that's, most of it is dance music. Most of it has always been dance music. 
I just think that the, what I respond to is lyricism and the writing. And that, that seems to have taken a real, what, what people can get away with and be rappers today is like, what? You call that a rhyme? That's not even a couplet, dude. <laughs> so, so I think that just from a technical, old school, I'm from New York, so I, you know, I, I listen to Wu-Tang records. So like some, some trap kid from Atlanta talking about, it's, it's hard for me to get to. But I don't want to be, again, I don't want to be the old guy at the club. <laughs> so, so I just leave it at that. A, a good luck with that, by the way, the Death Row doc. Thanks. <laughs> so uh, um, I have to go. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. <laughs>